Falls, and is being presented by me. Is that better? Okay. Again, my talk is telling of firewalls. Closer? Hey. Let me let me try something first. Hey. Thank you. Got plenty of cable. That's always good to know. Um, start at the beginning. What is tunneling? Tunneling is uh, essentially creating a virtual data path between two computers, potentially using their protocol. The example given is you can use the uh, HTTP protocol between two machines to do telnet. Where's it? Oh, I turned it on. Oh, no, it is on. Uh, sorry. Listen to this. Oh, well. I'll try it next time. All right. There's a couple of, well, there's a bunch of available tunneling software, but the most popular one right now is GNU HTTP Tunnel. It's really generic and it's really quite nice. It's been developed by some groups that, some guys at NoCrew. Uh, there's also a variety of homegrown solutions that do roughly the same thing that HTTP Tunnel does. They usually aren't as well designed, don't handle proxies near as well. Uh, this is an example network. We've just got the firewall only allowing outgoing connections on port 80 for regular HTTP. All their access is blocked. An example being 23 for Telnet is blocked, 21 all the standard ports. That's the only way you can get out. And let me uh, flip over to this. Type Telnet space home. And unable to connect to remote host connection refused. This machine is work. This machine is home, by the way, for this. The Mac is the other one. All right. So let me start the HTTPS tunnel server on home. Now we've established half of a connection. Well, actually a third of it, the way it's set up right now. Now we run the client side on the other machine. Sorry. Okay, now we have a virtual data path from two machines. Now I'll just do telnet to this machine work on port 2323, because that's why I've set it up with a minus F option. And it's connected to the other remote machine now. So you can get by pretty much any standard blocking procedure. Because a lot of people with their firewalls will allow anything out on port 80 because that's what you use for HTTP access for just regular web browsing stuff like that. You can use this to run anything you want to pretty much. You can run X over it, SSH, anything. I mean I would never run Telnet over it in a real world situation because that's just stupid. So let me go back to the thing now. Uh, that's actually a bug with rock. It uh, tends to, it does 3, 2, 1 every time you type a character. But it makes it look more impressive at least. So, so how does HTTP tunneling work? Well, we've started both HTS and HTTC on the respective machines. Uh, we've sent the command. And what it does is it encapsulates that into an HTTP packet, sends it via HTC over to the other machine, and the HTS receives that. Uh, tears apart the HTTP packet and then sends the command locally. And then it also passes the data back, of course. The basic protocol is uh, formatted in a really simple, it's a very simple protocol they've laid out. It can, it, this protocol allows it to pass through a variety of proxies along the lines of squid, pretty much anything. You can get, if you can get access out any way, you can use this to do a port forwarding and other th types of options. The protocol has seven different requests. Five requests send additional data, and two just send a command to it, to their side. 
The two types of requests are the request with a 0x 40-bit consists of one byte with just a command and along the lines of open, close, disconnect. And the request with the 0x 40-byte clear have a two-bit length field along the variable data field. I'll show you in a sec. There are seven different requests. Tunnel open, tunnel data, tunnel padding, tunnel error, tunnel pad one, and tunnel close, and tunnel disconnect. Tunnel open is just the first request. You send that from the client to the server, and it creates a virtual data path. Data is just whatever command you want to encapsulate into an HTTP request. An example being when it's converted into uh, like the telnet command, it puts that into an HTTP style header that's compliant with the standard. The padding is used if you're going through a proxy like Squid, because Squid usually you set it to 32K. And it will fill up the rest of that data, so it will actually send that command now instead of just holding it in the proxy. And it will also use that on the way back, so you can get the command right away. Um, Tunnel errors, in case you have a rare example where you have an error in the connection. Right now, this is not a real robust protocol because you're running another protocol on top of HTTP and taking advantage of get and put. And that can occasionally have problems if you're going between incompatible versions of stuff. Uh, tunnel pad one just exists if you have a buffer size set greater than 32K. I mean, you very rarely do you do with a proxy, but if you have a really low link connection, you will. But also, I would beat the crap out of the system because it sends a bunch of one byte packets, and every one of those just has to be encoded. Uh, tunnel close, close at the tunnel. Pretty much straightforward. Tunnel disconnect is used to temporarily disconnect the connection. So, very simple protocol. That's one of the reasons why it works so well because they've designed it pretty robustly and it works on a variety of systems. We've used it a few times, and I'll say where you use it in a little bit here. Actually, right now, uh, Y tunnel. One of the reasons what you do is you have a static link program without source. Some of them expect a certain port, and you cannot give them that port. An example being if you have a web server that only will uh, work on port 80, and you have to move to 8080 for some various reason, you can use this to do a shift of it. Another reason is you have limited access to the outside world. A lot of times, like if you're using a connection like uh, AltaVista, it won't give you port 20, 25 for SMTP. It will give you port 80. You can use this to send stuff remotely. And of course, the third reason is evil system administrators trying to hold you back. <laughs> the question is, how do you combat tunneling? The first thing is sniffers work great. Because nothing tends to deter people more than seeing a dump with all their passwords and account names on their desk in the morning. If they're stupid enough to use a tunnel program and you told them not to, they're probably stupid enough to use some of this and stuff in clear text. Uh, another thing is look for signatures of the telling software. If you use the source for uh, HTTP tunnel, there are certain signatures you can find in it right now. As the saying goes, use the source, Luke. Uh, another way to do it is policy. Explain the security problems someone could be opening up. Obviously, an example being here that if it's great going out, but we could also do this somehow getting in. I could open a port that's a very high number, and no one would even, like above 1024, and it would allow that stuff in. I can shift that to some other part of the machine. And the other way to really combat telling is education. Ask why people are using telling software. Can you help them remove the need for it, like by installing a SOX proxy or something? There's an old story about Patton when he was at West Point. He was a part of the uh, faculty. He wasn't part of the faculty. He was a student, part of the student government, and he was asked what they could do about people walking on the grass all the time. And his response was, "Well, put sidewalks where the people are walking." This is the same idea. If they're using the telling software, usually they have a reason for it besides just to be dicks. <laughs> and the answer is to help find out what that problem is and to help them find a solution for it. What's the future HTTP tunnel? They've got a bunch of things on their to-do list. These are the ones I thought were most important. They're going to add SSL encryption someday. They're waiting, obviously, until after September 20th when the RSA patent expires, and they also have to deal with the export restrictions, which not a lot of people are thrilled with. Data compression, there's a version of it out there that uses Zlib, but it has some issues. You're always padding the entries out with HTTP headers, which can be quite uh, uh, wasteful. They're also trying to extend it so it can work with other protocols like FTP. Their goal eventually is to be able to call it XTP tunnel, and be able to use any transport, use Telnet, anything to do it. There's work on that. It's still very early, but it's going to really change the way it works, because it's going to make it very hard to detect and stop. 
And the other way they're trying to do is they're trying to add this now, simple encoding red trivial sniffing. Not rod 13, but a little bit more advanced than that. They're trying to like add some random type signatures to it. Um, tunneling is a very valuable tool. We've used it a little bit here and there because it's, ha it's helped us in certain situations where we need to use it. Uh, tunneling can also bypass security measures. That's a, probably the biggest single problem with tunneling. It can bypass any firewall you have if you set it up correctly. Because you're creating a virtual path and whatever you're adding on top of that is up to the user. What you're doing is you're hiding the data inside a more uh, acceptable protocol. And education and training are pretty much the best defense. Uh, the main links for it is GNU HTTP Tunnels website and the Firewall Piercing Mini How To. You can find either one of these just by doing a search in Google without any problems. Uh, the first question anyone always asks me is, is there a Windows version of it? And the answer is yes, there is. It runs under the Cygnus uh, SigWin Toolkit. The other question I usually ask is, is there a Macintosh version of it? And no, there's not. It will run on Mac OS X server edition, but it hasn't been officially ported yet. There's also, it works on pretty much any standard version of Unix like FreeBSD or Solaris or any of the standard ones. The third question usually I'm getting asked is, hang on a sec. Oh, uh, will it run under web server? Since I overloaded port 80 on this, will this work consistent concurrently with a web server? Right now, not, but they are working on that as well. But we're not sure how that's going to work because they're going to have to override the way the behavior happens a bit right now because it has one session on both sides. Meanwhile, the web server will fork off multiple copies to handle that. But they're working on that piece. Uh, any other questions? Sure. Does it work through what, sir? It works through net, uh, network, uh, network address and translation. It will work through that if you can get a direct path back to it. If you're doing real masquerading, no, because it doesn't have a path back. It will work outgoing, of course, but coming back, it won't work into it. So that's one of the first steps of defense of it. Yes? What are uh, it's actually, that's what it's designed for. <laughs> that's when though, there's a, some options that will go through like any standard proxy. Sometimes you have to figure out the real port the proxy exists at. And the FAQ has the instructions for doing that. I don't have a proxy set up on this one, but it does work with Squid and uh, all the standard ones I've seen. Yes, it is. If you send it in clear text, you're asking for it. What you do is you run a, a more secure protocol on top of like SSH if you want to protect your stuff. It will might show up with a simple, some basic encoding on it. Like if you've got spaces in your password, which I do and most people should, it'll show, it'll back, it'll escape those. But the password is pretty trivial to figure out. So always, this is just a great, this is a great tool to use. But make sure to use something secure on top of like. Uh, uh, SCFDP or SSH and stuff like that to give you an additional level of stuff. Yes? If you're going through a proxy, does anything end up in the cache? Uh, yes, it does. They have added a, a fix in 303 that has a random ID to the end of it, so it, it does not have the same entry. So you can have, like, my first command has got uh, certain trailing, trailing information on it. My second will have another random number and so on and so forth. So you'll add a lot of random entries to the cache, but each one will be unique. So you won't have a replay problem. It'd be really tough to play back the session. Uh, the question is, could you run across the entire uh, telnet session in the cache? Yeah. I mean, if you've got your proxy turned on, or if you've got your proxy caching, uh, logging everything, it's going to do a straight dump of this session. So do not use this with telnet. That's rule number one. Yes, it does. It actually does encapsulate it in real HTTP. It does comply with 3.0 standard. Uh, could you repeat the last part? It 
will be we will be seeing ordinary web traffic for the most part, but there will be certain signs that you can see if you know what to look for, because it does use certain identifiers in a different way than the other piece than regular like uh, Netscape tends to do things. But it's kind of hard to find. But you can go through a log if you know what to look for. They're working on adding that as well. That's the trivial. That's the uh, simple encoding they're trying to do to make it look more like an Netscape session or something else. You can't. That's the problem. That, that, the answer to the question is, can you prevent it from getting through a firewall? And if you open up any port, you can use software like this to get through the firewall. The, the, you can do add some things like network access translation to make it tougher to get uh, so they can't open something inside your local net. But to get out, you can't stop it. You can also use this to go out, hit other sites. Actually, like you can use your home machine, set up a Netscape session on that, send the X window stuff through, and browse all the porn you want to while you're at work. In regards to how they block, block stuff, I'm not saying you would, but some people do. <laughs> not, uh, here on the question about the performance, the performance can suck. Uh, it's encapsulating every single command inside an HTTP header. The secret to this is have a good connection. Uh, I would, didn't have a cable modem, I probably wouldn't try it. Also, the question is what you're sending across it. Like when we send X across it. Unless you're using uh, the compression options inside the later versions of X, you are going to be paying a lot because it sends everything back and forth as a unique packet. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, have I tried to use delegate uh, SSL proxies instead of just using regular HTTP proxies? The answer to that is no, I haven't yet. They probably have done it at this site. They do have a mailing list, and so that's pretty good. A lot of questions like that. Okay. Oh, actually, you can. You know, yeah, if you use something that would do compression, that's one of the reasons they're looking to add Zlib to it to help improve the performance on it quite a bit. Uh, way back there. The question is, well, to, to make it much shorter, is can you use this with something like a like a Java applet to, to move stuff around in terms of ports? I, yes, you can. But the question is, can you with the performance issues of it? I don't think it would really be that useful. You can obviously take a look at the source. It is open source, so they can do license. And some of the pieces there are very good. There's also more generic uh, port forwarding tools like Leapfrog, which you might want to take a look at because that will do some of that work. And that you can hit www.coste.com slash leapfrog or do what I do and hit Google and do leapfrog search. Any more questions? Yes, sir. That's a very good question. Uh, what happens if you have open port 80 on your home computer? It's very, um, you have opened up a port to, you can bind what port that can connect to. So if you do have something like SSH, you can only bind it so it can hit that SSH port. You can, there's basically port forwarding on this end. So you're... Uh, your host out a while will watch... No, actually, just tell it use that. SSH doesn't. SSH has its own configuration utilities. You can set. Yeah. Okay. Then yes, you can use that in situation. Yes, sir. The question is: Can you use this as can you use this as a proxy to send requests out to your machine, home machine and have that do the surfing for you? I haven't done that. It may be possible. What I've done is I've run X across it, and then just brought up a Netscape from my home machine. It was quite slow, but it did work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
probably not because of the overhead of sending back all the all the stuff. I mean, it worked better than doing it the way I was doing it running X, where it sends every pixel back to you. But it, I'm not exactly sure on how the performance of that would work and using it that way. It's a great question to ask on the mailing list. They're a pretty active group. They're uh, up to th version 303 now, and they're getting ready to release 304, and they'd love some help getting it up to spec where they want it to go in a couple areas. Yes? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, the main purpose of this is to help educate people to a firewall will not stop all your problems. It's a great first step, but you also have to understand what the firewall does and doesn't allow. And that's just a part of the process of learning how to do what it does do, keeping in touch with your users. Because if you do put up walls high enough against your user, they will find ways around them. They always have and they always will. Thank you very much.